view, but it's scary out there. <laughs> I feel a lot safer in here. Let's see, we got a tour group in there. We got a tour group in there. So I guess we're going upstairs. What do you say? Yeah. We'll start on top and finish on the bottom. So come on, let's go to the second floor. <laughs> Carter House side before we begin things here. Are you all battled out? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'll just make you think about that day after. Yeah. Yeah. December December first was uh, was a long day. Um, it's interesting the variance in accounts from the battle to the day after. Especially those who were involved in the burial details. It was particularly difficult work, um, burying well in excess of 2,000 bodies um, and going back into that wreckage, um, really of both sides, was another element of the story that, that those, who, those who survived it really never forgot. And the townspeople began to wander out toward the battlefield because remember where we were the town was behind the US line so they unlike the Carters and the McGavocks who were so impacted by the battle had largely been shielded from it they had heard it but it wasn't until the next day that that they really began to see how how bad it was well again we've got there's two groups down the, downstairs and there's a small one across the hall so we'll be kind of dodging all around but well, I'll start where, here where did they bury them and largely they, where they fell. Are we still there? No, the Confederate dead were moved here um, to Carnton in 1866. The U.S. dead were moved to Murfreesboro, to the National Cemetery. Um, but there were some bodies that were unaccounted for. There were some that were never found. And not to be you know, too graphic, but there were, just, there were some bodies that there was never anything to bury. They were just gone. Just, they just disappeared. In the, in the carnage of the battle. Um, just some basic uh, background on Carnton. This house was built in 1826. This was a very, very large farm. This was substantially larger than, than the Carter farm, almost 700 acres. Again, corn and grain, livestock operation. The McGavocks owned 40 slaves when the war broke out, but they were very wealthy, worth today what would be about six or seven million dollars. If you look out the windows, they owned all the land north to the Harpeth River all the land east to the river, south to about where Downs Boulevard is today, and then west of the railroad tracks, which you might have remembered when we crossed. The railroad tracks were actually the, <coughs> the boundary between uh, John McGavick's property and Fountain Branch Carter's property. The unique element of the battle here, and what, what you get at Carnton is really two ends of the spectrum. You see the early stages of the battle unfold here, and then you see the aftermath because Carnton becomes a very, very large field hospital, in fact, the largest in the, in the area following the battle. But that afternoon, the McGavocks had a very unique spot. 
they were stuck in no man's land between the two armies. Whereas, of course, at Carter House, they're just inside the U.S. line. The McGavocks are stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. In fact, the closest house to Carnton at the time was the Carter House. So there was nothing but open farmland between here and there. And just to orient everyone, that's north. So when you come out here, it's easy to get all turned around. So north, south, west, east. Southern Army is forming up just barely three quarters of a mile south of the house. It would have been plainly visible from here, the Federal Army just out to the northwest. <clears throat> so when the Confederates begin to advance, the right wing of the Southern Army moves through this area. But as the Southern Army moves through here, they are almost immediately under fire once they come within range of the Federal guns. And when I say guns, I'm talking artillery. One of the things that we do at both places, a key component to our daily interpretation, is education. And that doesn't mean educating the young. It means educating y'all. Because a lot of people don't know the range of artillery fire, the range of rifle fire. There's lots of myths that, you know, that permeate the Civil War era. We'll talk about some surgical and hospital myths when we get across the hall. But I'm going to throw this question out because this is a key part of understanding this battlefield. What's the accurate range of artillery fire during the Civil War? Anyone know? 1,500 yards? Pretty close. Okay, About 6,000 feet. They were deadly accurate at just over a mile. Most people don't know that. Rifles were deadly at four to 500 yards. Mm. One of the reasons for major casualties in the Civil War is the tactics had lagged behind the new weaponry. Artillery fire was lethal in the Civil War. We are almost exactly one mile from the left flank of the U.S. Army. We're about 1.1 miles on a straight line from Carter House. But when you cross the railroad tracks, you might have noticed there's a little park there right along the road, kind of butts up to the tracks. That was another piece of ground that was saved a number of years ago. But when you cross the tracks, to your back left would have been the left flank of the U.S. Army. It cuts right through a, a developed residential area today. There were ten pieces of artillery back there. Those ten guns had this area well within range and had it zeroed in. Those ten guns, over the course of four hours of fighting, fired over 1,100 rounds. They're not firing those, you know, cute round iron balls you see in the movies sometimes. They're firing explosive shell, anti-personnel weaponry. It detonates in the air or can detonate on impact with the ground. We'd know it as shrapnel. These conical shaped shells would explode, sending jagged iron fragments flinging in from all directions. Those shells traveled about 1,700 feet a second, which means it's slow enough that you can see it, but it's too fast for you to get out of the way. And as the right wing of the Southern Army, which is composed of Major General William Loring's division and Edward Walthall's division, Loring's coming through here, Walthall's out in the fields to the west, about 6,500 Southern troops, so about a third of the attacking force is moving through here in that direction. As they clear the house, as they come up out of the low ground, because there's a creek down here that empties into the river, so once they clear that terrain, clear the house, the outbuildings, there's a barn, shed, stables all around here. They move out into those open fields. That is a perfect target for artillerymen. And they begin hammering on the Confederate troops. Unlike what happens in the middle, where the southern troops under the command of Generals Claiborne and Brown are shielded by Wagner's guys who are out front, there's nothing out here but open space between here and the left flank. There was a man in the 33rd Mississippi who said the first shell from the Federal guns took seven men out of his company. An Alabama soldier said it took them three shots to get the range. He said the first shot went screaming over our heads, the second shot detonated right in front of us, and the third one exploded right above us. That all happens in about 45 or 50 seconds. And from that way in, they've got the range all the way, and they're just laying down a scathing fire on the southern troops. As the Confederates come through here, that's when Carnton was taken as a field hospital. 
and the first of the wounded began to arrive. This was a logical place for a hospital because it would end up behind southern lines. John and Carrie McGavick, who lived here, had a seven-year-old daughter, or seven-year-old son, and a nine-year-old daughter. It's a much smaller family than the Carters. Their first exposure to the battle, beyond the sound, were men being brought into their house who'd been hit by artillery fire. That was their first experience with the battle at about a quarter after four. And then everything I just described over there is unfolding as the wounded continue to stumble out into this direction. Doctors arrived here. They began to set up in the south rooms of the house, the chief surgeons. Best we can tell, there are about six or seven inside, maybe six or seven outside. They all worked in the south rooms primarily. They're dealing with the critically injured there. What's the advantage of the south rooms? Sunlight. Sunlight. They moved the less injured into the north rooms. That's where we're at. They were dealing with flesh injuries and superficial kinds of wounds here. They were dealing with the badly injured on the south side. And the work continued all that night well into the next day. A Mississippi surgeon who was here named George Phillips said he worked for nearly 36 straight hours. By the middle of the night, according to a man who was here, there were about 300 wounded in the house. I don't know how many are in the group. What, 30, 35? 30. There's about this number in every room. Except they're not standing up. They're on the ground or on the floor, propped up in the corners. The whole house is filled. As one man said, when the noble old house could fill no more, they'd begin to take them outside. They were on the porch. They were in the barn, the stables, the other outbuildings. They were in the slave cabin south of the house. There were some buildings out to the east that were filled. By the time it was all over, there were six or seven hundred wounded Confederates here. There were thousands of others out to the west and the northwest. <coughs> and in the midst of all this, you had a man and his wife and two little children and about six or seven doctors, trying to save as many people as they could. By the time you leave today, you'll have probably said, this might be one of the most depressing stories I've ever heard. <laughs> I have come to understand that there are some elements of American history, or just history in general, that are like that. There are some stories that don't have a happy ending, nothing even remotely close to it. But there is something about this place that I've always found is very interesting. There was a lot of good here. You know the old adage that you see the best of people in the worst of times? That's what was happening here. You saw a small family and a handful of very dedicated doctors trying to save lives. That's it. Nothing showy about it. They didn't brag about it. They didn't write much about it. They just tried to save lives, as many as they could. The McGavicks were certainly never forgotten for their efforts here that night. In fact, an Alabama soldier said his... Greatest memory was watching the McGavick son go around a room with a little tin cup filling it up with water. It's a seven-year-old boy. I know adults who couldn't handle what was going on in here. And here was this little boy. People ask me all the time different things about the house. What about this? What about that? What do you see? Have you ever seen anything? I've never seen anything other than what I see. It was a very quiet piece to it. Nothing scary about it. Nothing at all. It's just an old home. And think about that, just like I mentioned earlier that that was Fountain Branch Carter's home. This was theirs. This was their home. John and Carrie McGavick were married almost 50 years. They raised their children here after the war. The kids were both married here. They had grandchildren running around the house by the 1880s. Life went on. As terrible as this day in 1864 was, Life did go on. The war ended. The grass got green. The soldiers went home. The dying stopped. And they started to rebuild their lives in an area that was often very volatile after the war. When we're done, and I'll get you out of here in time, because you're going to the cemetery, yes? That's another place you're just going to walk through on your own. That was their post-war life, a huge part of it. They maintained the graves of almost 1,500 men who were killed here. They were buried in their backyard. <clears throat> Imagine wherever it is you're from, whatever town, whatever community, whatever county, whatever part of whatever state, think about if people came to your house and wanted to know if someone they loved was buried in your backyard. That happened here. 
See, truth is stranger than fiction. You don't have to make this stuff up. This really happened. Right here. So there's a couple of other places in the house that I want you to see, especially across the hallway. Any questions? There's a picture over here of Sarah Polk, which I think is President Polk's wife. Mm -hmm. What's the significance of that? There was a soldier here named Roland Jones from Mississippi who spent many months convalescing here. In fact, he was the last man to leave Carnton seven months after the battle. This was a hospital for a long time, in lessening degrees, obviously. But he corresponded with her. She was living in Nashville. And they knew each other in some shape or fashion. We've never quite figured out how they got to know each other, but that's his image there on the left. And they corresponded. It is said that Mrs. Polk had the only, how or had the only horse left in Nashville, personally owned. <laughs> we confiscated every horse from every citizen in the city, except Mrs. Polk. Even Andrew Johnson couldn't take her horse off. <laughs> How many uh, rooms does this house have? It has eight primary rooms. All eight are 20 by 20. This house is an old federal style of design. It is perfectly symmetrical. If you stripped and bare, you'd hardly know the difference between the rooms. Let me make sure the room across the hall is open, because I won't get in there. Because that's where we're going. But if it's still full, we're going to do something here. Just hang on one second. <laughs> this, at the time of the war, was a bedroom for the McGavick son, whose name was Winder McGavick. He was seven. And this room would be one in the house that was used extensively by some of the surgeons. And there are blood stains all throughout this room. So like some of the physical evidence you saw at the Carter house with the bullet riddled outbuildings, just look over into that area, and you'll see some of the most significant blood stains in the house. That upside down U-shaped section is very likely where a doctor or several worked that night. They wore a frock made of fabric much like a raincoat, so it's slick, and it just begins to build around them. These rooms were all carpeted. People of this time frame did not have bare floors. So this is where it was so bad it soaked through the carpet. But there's a stain over here. There's some back here. There's a huge pooled area back in the corner. The light's not terribly good, but it's really all throughout this room. There are also heavy blood stains in the room directly across the hall. There were blood stains far worse downstairs. But this house was privately owned and lived in until the mid-1970s. The bloodstains were sanded away downstairs in the 1960s. A prime example of how history is lost with time. And what's left is upstairs. What you see here is a, a rough recreation of a very makeshift hospital setting. So the surgeons, working by the windows, they want the windows for good light, but they need the windows for another reason. Now this is going to make you feel hopefully better about the overall medical situation. And now we're going to bash away at some old myths. Civil War soldiers were not biting on bullets and drinking alcohol while they underwent amputations. So if you leave here and ever encounter someone who has to try to promote that myth, tell them how wrong they are. You learned it on a trip to Tennessee. Chloroform. <laughs> had been in use as an anesthetic for a decade before the Civil War. It is ether-based, so you need good ventilation. But these soldiers were sedated. The survival rates in field hospitals like this often ranged as high as 75 to 80 percent. The doctors were saving three out of four lives on average. They do not get the credit they deserve in large circles. We make it a job here every day to get them the credit they deserve and to tell the truth about Civil War surgery. Doctors struggled with things like post-operative infections because they didn't know what germs or bacteria were. But what they could see, feel, and touch, they did great work. They worked in close tandem with stretcher bearers and litter bearers, same thing, and triage officers. Triage was effectively used for the first time in the American Civil War. Job of a triage officer is incredibly difficult. You're out where the fighting is the heaviest, working with the stretcher bearers, and you're determining who should be moved, but you're also doing something else. 
you're determining who should not be moved. Bad head injuries, abdomen wounds where there's organ damage, they're dead men. You don't move them. You move the men you feel that you can save. And by that way, you push up the survival rates. I studied, this was William Loring's field hospital. I studied the casualties of his division extensively a number of years ago. The best we can tell of roughly 700 wounded, about 50 of them died. That is a tremendous survival rate. It is testament to the work done by the medical staff. It's also something of a testament to the house, and it's just, it was a great hospital setting. Good ventilation, heat source. It was crowded, but there was ample space. It was a good place for a hospital. By late December, they were down to about three dozen wounded. So a lot less than 300, but still a pretty sizable amount. And then a spattering of lesser numbers throughout the early part of 1865. One of the men who was here for many months, you might take a look in this little case, you'll see a photo of a fellow named John Hampton, who later became a doctor. He lost his foot as a result of artillery fire. He was here until March, one of the last. Any questions up to this point? So the, the wife who lived here, did she have to cook for all these people then that stayed on, all the that were recuperating? She, she did the best she could. There was a soldier, actually an officer, who was here the next morning <coughs> doing some casualty assessments. He said that he found Carrie McGavick at 9 o'clock in the morning, cooking breakfast. Bottom of her dress stained with blood. Always thought that was such a great insight into the next day because there wasn't anything really glowy or romantic about it. It was just a very stark look into that morning and what was she doing? Trying to put food in the mouths of some of these men. Obviously couldn't take care of all of them, but just doing what you could. And what a timeless example of humanity that is in a situation that's completely out of hand, completely chaotic, you can't control anything, you do what you can, and you just get to work. And those who were here never forgot what they saw along those lines. This small family just pitching in alongside the doctors and helping how they could, where they could, and when they could. And how often did uh, survivors come back and visit? Did that ever happen? Oh, yes. There were, there were quite a number of men who came back here. Not just survivors, but people who came back who had lost someone in the battle to visit the cemetery. You know, it didn't happen every day, every week, every month, but there was a steady flow of them through the years. This became a... I think it's a tragedy that the, the story was so forgotten because it was not forgotten for decades after the war. But when all of those people's voices were stilled, then it was forgotten which is really the curse of history in some ways. That an event reaches an age where no one talks about it or feels it anymore. It becomes less significant. That has happened in some ways with events that, I mean, have happened in our own lifetime. We were just talking the other day about the impact of 9-11. There's a whole group of people young enough that they don't remember it. It will never be the same to them that it is to us. But it's the job of a few crazies like me to tell them it was important and that it impacted a group of people collectively, like Pearl Harbor. I mean, someone asked me that one day about how do you tell the story that's a century and a half old? And I said, well, 140 years from now, someone's going to have to take a group, maybe of some folks who are descendants and a few local politicians and the tour group operator and whoever it is, down into lower Manhattan and explain to a group of people who were not alive and were born long after it ever happened what, what happened. How do you tell people about planes hitting buildings and people jumping out of them and then they came down and what the aftermath of that was like? How do you relate that? Do you just relate it in just bare abstract facts? Or do you try and get people to feel something? I said earlier this morning, you can get people to understand any. Two plus two equals four. It's cold outside. Yeah, you got to get them to believe it. And maybe there's someone in this group, by the time you leave today, you'll actually believe this. Not that it did or didn't happen, but that it, it's important. 
You don't just leave going, oh, that was interesting. I learned a lot about the Battle of Franklin. But you actually believe that this was a key part of our shared history. What do you think? Are you all toured out? Are you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your college football team? You're in the South, so we have to talk about college football. You don't have one? Who's your favorite athlete? Who's your favorite politician? <laughs> Who's your favorite president? Um, keep you warm at night. So that was like the boys. You know, it's not really indicative of that he would have had it. It's just a bed style of the era. Quite handy this time of year. Mm -hmm. What happened to the slaves? They were, were all they gone. Here? Nope. John had shipped all the slaves away to Alabama in 1862. In an irony of ironies, um, he could well have kept them because the Emancipation Proclamation didn't apply to Tennessee. So they would have been legally his property until Tennessee um, outlawed slavery just before the 13th Amendment was passed. But of course, Lincoln makes the exclusions. I mean, that's a very, it's a wartime very much a wartime measure aimed at crushing the underpinning of what was left of the rebellion. But yeah, Tennessee was exempted. Why were they exempted? It was all states in rebellion against the United States, wasn't it? Except areas that were already controlled by the U.S. government or had stayed loyal. And Tennessee was mostly under control of U.S. troops. There were some areas of Louisiana that were exempted, like New Orleans. Um, it, was a, it was a brilliant move. I mean, he exempts Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland. They've stayed loyal. Exempts Tennessee because it's under U.S. control. What he's trying to do is hit the South underneath um, because slaves were property. And if you could spread the word that they were free, they would leave. And the slaves were a huge part of the underpinning of the Confederate um, military because slaves were being put to work doing all sorts of things that whites would have to do if the slaves didn't do. So by granting freedom, you had this mass exodus, and it crippled the Confederate military. Where did the name Carrington come from? The house was built by John McGavick's father. Um, Randall McGavick um, lived here until the early 1840s. Randall's father was from Ireland. And the old ancestral home in Northern Ireland was called Cairntown. And so he just Americanized it. C-A-I-R-N-T-O-W-N. And he just changed it. Were they the McGavick's buried in Nashville? Are they buried in Nashville? Same family, not this way. Okay. It's Randall's brother. Oh. Now, on a side note, I have been so amused through the years to hear people try and say Carton. It is the greatest tongue twister I think I've ever experienced. I've heard, I've heard at least ten different variations on how people say it. It really throws them for a loop. Let's see if we can uh, hit the downstairs area and then we'll be done. John was 49. The daughter, Hattie, who I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned Hattie, you know, I talked about Winder as a portrait of her late in her teens, so it's about 10 years after the, after the battle or the war. <coughs> Hattie McGavick lived until 1932. Lived a long time. She always maintained her most vivid memory was the smell of blood in the house. Nothing so much she saw but the terrible smell. And if one considers carpets down everywhere and soaked with blood, which they couldn't get the carpets out for days, you can see why she never forgot the smell. I don't think I mentioned this at Carter House. I don't know if anyone had any questions about this aspect of the homes. These are original. There's not been any sort of restorative work to the structures. They're very much, almost exactly as they were when the families lived here. What about interior? Interior is very much like it was. Trim work, fireplace mantles. Chair rails, doors are all original. Even the paint colors of both homes are based on paint analysis. 
These are colors that existed when they lived here. This wallpaper pattern, we know the McGavicks had, as well as in the hallway. All the family portraits in both homes were donations by descendants. All the furniture is of the era, so no reproductions. Very much mid-19th century, everything. But there are a few things, and what got me to thinking about that, there are a few things in this room that belong to the family. There's a music box back here, that upper painting on the left, family Bible here on the table in the middle. But there is one other thing in this room which I think is one of the... I just like it. I think that's what it really comes down to. It's a family piece. I've always liked it. And you just have to listen. It still keeps almost perfect time. 150 years later. It hasn't been wound, so it's lagging. But you can hear it. Everyone should get to hear it chime 4 p.m. on November 30th, just once. And think about what began to race through the minds of these people who were not soldiers. And wonder what was going through their heads as they began to see their lives change. Were they political? Do you know? Um, we know enough about their politics to kind of get a sense of who they were as far as the secession crisis was concerned. John McGavick was an old Jackson Democrat, which means he likely would not have been a big secession proponent. Ja John attended the 1860 Democratic National Convention in Charleston, South Carolina. And he was therefore witness to one of the greatest political shows in American history. If you think 1968 in Chicago was good times, you should have been in Charleston in 1860. <laughs> the Democratic Party split three ways. I'm sure that Abraham Lincoln would win the presidency with 39% of the vote, which is still the lowest total of any elected president in American history. But the Democrats only had themselves to blame. They split the party. But a lot of folks like John McGavick, who were in their late 40s, found Branch Carter. They were Southerners, and they were Tennesseans, but Tennessee was divided. And they didn't, they didn't see secession as the necessary avenue. But they were Southerners. And Tennessee secession was unavoidable. Once Arkansas and North Carolina began moving that way, there was no way that Tennessee you know, to be perfectly frank, there was no way Tennessee could side with Iowa and Minnesota and New York versus Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. They simply could not do it. No more than someone from the northern states could support Texas. It just wasn't going to work, and so they went. But I think a lot of people, especially around here, all they had to do was look at a map and know that when the invasion began, was going to come right through here. It did. But I think I started at the Carter House earlier by talking about that there's been a lot of troop movement, but they just hadn't been affected. And that all changed that last day in November. It's a great place. So is Carter House. But our work over the last decade has been to save much of the battlefield, as much as we some of us have this crazy dream that you'd be able to walk from Carter House to Carnton one day on the battlefield. And it's not that far-fetched a reality. There are pieces of property between them. You might have to zigzag that walk. But it could happen. And I've been known to... I always believe that historical interpretation is pushing the envelope. You're not supposed to make people necessarily always feel good and say what they agree with, you're supposed to challenge them sometimes. And I have said for a long time about this story, there were people who said we could never do it. They said this didn't matter. They said John Bell Hood was on Laudan and murdered his army. They said a lot of things. And they were wrong. They were wrong. They were wrong about this story. They were wrong about Nashville's story. There was a fellow today talking about Patrick Claybert. Who was anybody? Who was at the state event this morning? Did you see Damien Shields? Did, did you say? Is he not magnificent? Okay, Damien Shields is Irish, just like Patrick Claybert was. And so you hear, I chuckle at this because you often hear, first of all, Americans 
who were not born for 120 years after the Civil War talk about what would motivate an Irishman who would move to this country to fight for the South. And Damien and I were talking the other night, and, and he said, he made a great point. Claiborne dies at Franklin, and he said, it would have, and I, I can't do an Irish accent, especially with my voice all in tatters, but Damien said, it would have been shocking had he not died at Franklin. He knew where things were at that stage. And that type of interpretation is very new. And what has happened here, what you're getting to see, this insanity that's going on today, all this craziness, this isn't an aberration. There are 100,000 people a year now who visit these two homes. This story put that piece of wood underneath. <laughs> There, now, kick that piece of wood. There you go. Here, let the expert at it. There, I think it's good. You're in here. You can try it for somebody else. There we go. That type of interpretation is new. It's new in the last decade. And what's happened is the people have started to come. What's the old saying? You know, if you build it, they will come. We've saved the battlefield, the houses are restored. And I would hope that there's someone in this group that when you leave, you'll go, wow, you know, I didn't know what I was going to expect, but this is quite a place. This is a really interesting story. It's a sad story. But I think maybe that's some of the power of it. It makes you think. And think about what. I started when I spoke at the event this morning. Think about what was happening 150 years ago right now. We're all going to go our merry way. You're probably going to have a great dinner. I'm having a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all going to go off. And we're going to go to sleep tonight in a warm bed. We're going to wake up tomorrow. We're going to kill it again tomorrow. There'll be a lot more people. It's going to be a great time. None of us are going to have to sleep. I mean, they're sleeping outside by choice because they're a little crazy. Mm -hmm. they, they like to reenact this stuff. But more power to them. We don't have to. We don't have dysentery. We have watched all our friends die. Our path is completely different. That was happening to us 150 years ago. And I encourage people all the time, because I get on the soapbox, and I'm like an old Methodist minister. You know, I'm like, you've got, you got to listen to this. You've got to hear this. Just to think about it. I told the group this morning, I hear people talk about this and that and this and that. And I love when I get to be in front of politicians. You know, I love it because I hear people talk about term limits. You've got to have term limits. You've got to throw these guys out of office. You're in office too long. Don't blame the politicians. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like them, vote them out. If you don't like something, change it. Don't sit around and complain about it. Do something about it. You want to save a battlefield, you got to go raise money. If you want to get people to come here, you got to do something to make it look good and have it be a good experience. Be proactive. That's what these people died for in some ways, especially the guys that saved the Union, so that this country would endure. And that doesn't mean the other side of the bad guys. They were fighting for what they believed in. But don't be complacent. Go out there and do something about it if you don't like something. And if you fail, try again. We get told no all the time. All the time. No, nope, can't do that, can't do that. Heck, I had the fire department out here earlier telling me I couldn't burn fires. I'm like, really? Well, you're going to have to give me a better answer than that. I don't want to burn fires one way or the other. You're not going to tell me I'm not going to. So we worked out a solution. Thank you very much. This has been, well, it's been enjoyable for me. I don't Thank know about you. Mm -hmm. I, lied, I lied and I said I would get you out there before dark, but you can still walk to the cemetery if you want to, or you can go to dinner, or you can come back another time and see it when it's not cold and it's not dark. I mean, we're not going anywhere. Is there anything particular in the cemetery? Any? No, it's just, it, it it's just a very, it's a unique place. You know, there's cemeteries or cemeteries or cemeteries. Um, but come back another time, maybe is the best to do it. It's great to walk through it in the spring. 
early morning light, late afternoon light. It's you wouldn't get the full experience walking through it in the dark, and it's cold out there. And I'm sure you all are tired of hearing about.